in the last year? How much did you use? Because shoot, I got an hour and a half of cardio in today. What'd you do? If I were to be on a motorbike and then crash, the company would pay out zero. And you will respect my Now this is gonna to come to a surprise uh, to a lot of you, but actually the speed of a bike, especially apples to apples compared to, let's say, a motorbike. Now intuitively we would think that a motorbike can go so much faster than a bicycle that surely it's faster every time. And in the right conditions, a highway for example, you're right. But in reality, we spend a lot of our time in town, right? In, in other words, a red light's a red light no matter what you're riding. Now, here's what's special about this, and to give you some data points. First of all, on average, uh, on this beast, I pull about 20, 21 kilometers an hour average uh, across the trip. Uh, I've topped her out at about 32 before. Pretty proud of that. But, uh, but yeah, when you're riding a motorbike through town, how much faster than that are you really going? Normally speaking, when I'm going with my wife, for example, yeah, we're going about 20 the, the whole way. In other words, uh, the bicycle and the motorbike is going about the same speed, generally speaking. Now, I tell you what, a bike, however, has advantages, especially in traffic. Now, this doesn't sound obvious at first, but bicycles effectively have like an unspoken right of way, which is to say people actually yield for bicycles way more than uh, they do for other motorbikes and certainly for other cars. Um, so all traffic regulations and so forth don't really truly apply uh, to a bicycle aside from the obvious common sense. An example of this is, oh, there's a traffic jam on this bridge. Oh, but I'm on a bicycle. I can just take the sidewalk that goes right around it. Motorbikes can't. As a result, I just crossed the bridge 10 times faster than all the other motorbikes. Yep, yep, that does happen. But on average, the difference between going in a motorbike or in a bicycle, in my experience, on average, it's about a 10% difference. That means if it takes me 15 minutes to get there by a, a motorbike, it'll probably take me 17 minutes uh, to get there by bicycle, on average. Sweet. So actually, it's not slower. In some ways, it's actually faster. So I got to go there. Owning a motorbike and driving a motorbike in Vietnam and in Asia, in general, is cheap and easy. Yep. Uh, with that said, it ain't expensive, but it ain't zero. It ain't zero. Let's face it. Um, at some point, you've got uh, to purchase the actual vehicle. Then you've got to apply gas to it on a fairly regular basis. Change the oil occasionally, let's just say. And uh, take care of it. And you can mitigate those costs and reduce those costs down. But at some point, they're not zero. These are very cheap to own and operate and maintain and all that. I mean, the obvious gas is zero. Oh, yeah! Bam. I joke with people like, uh, Yeah, Mao Sang la Mao Bang. Yeah, Nyang Bia la Mao Bang. Yeah, Nyang Ni Chi Kan Bia. You know, uh, this bike runs on beer, man. They're both gold, aren't they? Uh, this bike runs on beer, yours runs on petrol. Sweet. Um, but anyway, yeah, to give you some data points here, um, now, I got these used, obviously, but this guy right here, the bamboo, uh, I think I got that for about three million. Might have been two million. Uh, let's say three. Uh, and then I replaced it with gel tires. Sweet. That was about 300 grand uh, for the pair of them. And yeah, otherwise, uh, she's laughing. But yeah, cost-wise, to move on to the tandem here. Um, long story short, I got hooked this up to the Vietnamese network of used bikes, used everything. Uh, yeah, I got the, the fork itself from one of my coffee buddies who knew a guy who knew a guy who knew a guy who rang it up, called it up, and next thing you know, this uh, golden, rusted out pile here ended up showing up. Uh, anyway, he wanted two mil, negotiated him down to 600 grand. So we Yeah, but I had to change basically everything, including guards, tires, bearings, the whole works. I was stripped it to the fork. And uh, I was talking with the repair guys, we are trying to figure all this up, but I'm like, well, two million, do it. Will that make you happy? Cool. Just do what you gotta do, man. Finally, two million. Yep, gave it a paint job. That was about uh, 500 grand. Uh, but otherwise, like, yeah, a new chain's like 100 grand or 90 grand or less. Um, new wheel bearings are about 50 grand. Yeah, I mean, a brand new seat is about 50 grand. 
So, yeah, you can't go wrong. Like, uh, if I were to, uh, as long as the fork's in shape, you can't go wrong. Everything's so cheap and simple. That's not always true on a motorbike. Now, there are cheap ones, cheap throwaway ones. You can do that, yep. But generally speaking, I talk with a lot of my friends and it's not unusual to drop a couple million to repair this, fix that, you know, uh, you know, details along those lines. For two million, you could have a new bike and you're done for life. Just saying. So I gotta go there and cover this one. All right, now uh, to start things off, I'm not a real hippie, eco-friendly, eat vegan, you know, sort of fella, uh, but I became one automatically by having a bicycle. Yep. I mean, let's look at the obvious, like, you know, uh, burning petrol, carbon emissions, etc. To be fair, me respirating as a human, I emit, you know, carbon emissions into the earth. In fact, while I'm biking, probably more so. But we can't argue that it's less than burning fuel and running and operating a motorbike. Which is less than a car, which is less than everything. But really, the pinnacle of being like low CO2 emissions, that's a bike. It wins every time. It's a hippie trump card. Yeah, got it. And in fact, I pretty well have, have a, a zero, zero petrol, petrol lifestyle. lifestyle. So, awesome. You know, which is to say, I'm not funding like the, the petrol industry, the mining, the, the oil wars, etc. Ain't no Saudi getting rich off of me. Really. It's just my own efforts that's moving me around everywhere. I used zero fuel in the last year. How much did you use? Uh-huh, honey. Trump card, son. And while we're on the topic, starting from scratch, looking at building a motorbike versus building a bicycle, they're like an order of magnitude apart, really. I mean, let's think about it. The total amount of materials you need to build a bicycle is less than the total amount of materials you need to build a motorbike. I mean, to say nothing of the electronics and the plastic and this, you know, the, the, the huge seating and uh, you know, all the starters and what about the raw metal that it takes to build it and so forth. And then you gotta factor in lifespan. I mean, shoot, if I got a uh, tandem bicycle, tandem frame here, basic setup from the 1950s, it would still be good, good as gold right here today. In contrast, having a motorbike from the 1950s still in operation after all of these years would be inconceivable. In other words, the total amount of materials uh, my transportation requires from the time I'm born to the time I die on a bicycle is less than the total amount of materials it requires to build motorbikes, you know, and otherwise keep them on the road and keep them operation. So along the way, in my effort to pay zero taxes on this earth, gas tax, that exists. Pretty well every country has some kind of import gas tax. I pay none of it. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. So it's one step closer to the tax-free lifestyle. Oh yeah, parking. Yeah, it does come up in Vietnam where you, for example, where you have a bunch of motorbikes all stacked together. Now it's a jigsaw puzzle to get this puppy out of there and so forth, but you got a bike, so yep, yeah, you just grab her up. Peace. So another key aspect of the bike is the health, fitness uh, aspect of it all. And you knew I was gonna go there. I mean, it's inherent, it's inherent. But man, to give you a few data points, gosh, uh, in the course of a day, I, I travel quite a bit through my various gigs, so I might be 8K plus 7K, 2K, 1K, 8K, 11K. I might be jumping around the whole city. So by the time I'm done with the day, I've got an hour and a half clocked on this beast. Or I've gone like 60K, you know, or something. Oh, yeah! That happens all the time. In other words, I get free fitness out of the deal. It's awesome. Yeah, uh, in fact, I don't need to really go to a gym or focus too much on other things. Uh, because, shoot, I got an hour and a half of cardio in today. What'd you do? Mm. So yes, I do go by the uh, gyms occasionally that are just stacked with motorbikes outside of the front. And I just peek inside. Yeah, people on uh, electric exercise bikes. Reading a book and watching TV on an electric exercise bike inside of a gym. And I think, bless your guys' hearts. You could have really saved some time and saved some money 
Just get a bike in the first place, and you're all set. Become a reality, at least in your mind, with Peloton. Why pay $200 for a bike that can take you places when you can pay $2,200 for a Peloton that doesn't take you anywhere? You'll also get to pay a monthly fee of $39 for online streaming classes with high-energy instructors who are all, oddly enough, extremely not ugly and probably get coked up on the weekends. There's another hidden one. Uh, as you're biking and your heart rate goes up, as does the blood flow throughout your body and your brain. You wake up. It, uh, it helps you become a brighter, more focused person. Like, as an example, uh, maybe I get up early in the morning and want to go downtown at 8 or something. Well, I might not be worth a damn at 7, but you give me a half hour on a bike, ah, waking up, feeling the breeze, get some breakfast on the way, ah, get my heart rate up a little bit, get the blood flow in the brain, get ready for the day. That's awesome. So in between each of my gigs, I get anywhere from 10 minutes to a half hour of pedaling, you know, to wake up and uh, become a more real person. So yeah, uh, being on a bike, uh, you get a lot of exercise just for free. And if your goal here is to change your life, and in some cases, folks want to get in better shape or lose weight or whatever the case is, get a bike, get a bike. You're going to love it. Bicycle wins. So here's another idea, and uh, this is under the surface, so you wouldn't normally think it, but liability, liability. The, uh, the odds of hurting somebody else in the case of a accident go up if I'm on a motorbike, because A, it's heavier, B, it's uh, people don't yield as much, C, it goes faster, uh, D, you feel more confident on it. So adding those all up, it's more dangerous on a motorbike and you are more likely to hurt somebody else than if you're on a bicycle. The odds of hurting somebody else while you're on a bicycle are low, my friends. Um, I mean, obviously it's possible, but the odds of killing somebody while you're on a bicycle are basically zero. So liability and overall safety, the bicycle wins. I also wanted to bring up the safety aspect, the safety aspect. Now, on the surface, a lot of people look at like, oh my gosh, look at all this motorbike traffic in downtown Hanoi and you want to take a bicycle in there? Are you crazy? From the pictures, that makes sense. In practice, however, it's quite a bit different for a few reasons. First of all, we're not all downtown Hanoi, all right? Let's start there. Second, once again, they, they yield to, to bicycles a heck of a lot more. Great. Three. Bicycles, in general, move slower than a motorbike. What that means is, if I were to rev my motorbike up to maximum speed and then fall off of it, I'll probably die. You hit someone head on at 60 kilometers an hour, your odds of living are pretty low. In comes a meat wagon. Wee -oo, wee -oo, wee -oo. And the medic gets out and says, oh my god. New guy's in the corner puking his guts out. <laughs> <laughs> because of the built-in top speed of a, of a bicycle, you, the fastest you're gonna crash is at probably 30K an hour. And uh, in other words, you're more likely to survive a crash because you're going slower. Along the way, uh, when you're on a bicycle, you feel a lot more vulnerable compared to, let's just say, uh, you know, an SUV driver in America, you feel like you're in your shell of protection. So you can be overconfident and you can do what you want to do because you're in your safety shell. When you're on a bicycle, that's not true. And you don't feel that way and you don't have that illusion, to say it a different way. On a bicycle, you tend to be more careful. I tend to go slower and be ultra defensive. You go first, sir. No worries. There's a lot of traffic here. Why would I want to go against traffic and then cut up? I got time. I go slower and I think slower and I think safer because I don't have this artificial shell surrounding me, this artificial safety net. To be fair, I've got a helmet, you know, and I'm otherwise driving safely, but I'm just pointing out that a person tends to be more careful and a person tends to uh, drive more defensively and uh, you tend to just not take chances and just go out and chill. As a result, your mentality on a bicycle is a safer mentality than you would have on a, on a motorbike. And for that matter, a car. Bike wins.
Now, here's a secret one that you might not think of. Expat insurance, meaning traveler's insurance or insurance for people that are otherwise traveling you know, throughout Asia here and you pay whatever, anywhere from uh, $100 to $300 a month in order to travel, et cetera, et cetera. When you read that fine print, you're gonna find a nice little catch in there. If you're on a motorbike unlicensed and uninsured, which 90% of the case, that's true, uh, they, the expat insurance, won't pay out whatsoever. That's one of their exclusions. So that means if you get hurt, dismembered, hospitalized, or otherwise on a motorbike, they don't pay out. If I were to be on a motorbike and then crash, the company would pay out zero. If I'm on a bicycle and then uh, crash, or technically somebody hits me, I'm good to go. They pay out 100%. Yeah. So here's another big one that might not seem obvious. The legal implications. Now, we know many people will buy, operate, and otherwise drive a motorbike around uh, Vietnam or Thailand or Southeast Asia with no license, no insurance, uh, no ID, and no training of any kind, and otherwise get by totally sweet. All right, so let's acknowledge that. Now, with that said, in the long run, that's technically illegal. Uh -uh. So, what that means is they, Vietnam in particular, are cracking down on this. Which is to say, they're checking people's IDs, and do you have insurance, and where's your motorcycle permit, and so forth. And also, what is the title to your, uh, to your motorbike? And if you don't own that title, we're going to confiscate it. And on top of that, uh, if uh, you have to pay a fine because you're not driving legally. This is a thing, this is a big thing. It's happening all over. Mm. And by the way, I sort, of, I, I, I sort of agree with them. I see where their head's at. I, I agree with uh, uh, making driving, especially motorbikes, you know, more strict. That's great. It makes uh, the country more safe in general. Great. I agree with all this. None of that applies to me at all. A bicycle. Boom. There is no blue car. You can't confiscate it. In fact, there's no traffic law under your traffic jurisdiction that applies to me because I'm on a bicycle. You know, oh, ran a red light on a bicycle, that's equivalent of walking, which jaywalking is not heavily informed. I'm good to go. Oh, confiscate the bike, there is no license number, there is no retrieval system and so forth. As a result, there's no fine and no storage fee, it doesn't happen. <laughs> yeah, no matter how high up they dial up these uh, strictnesses and enforcement regulations here in Vietnam or other adjacent countries, doesn't apply to me. I'm on a bicycle. So, uh, there's a lot to be said about that. If an accident was caused by, let's say, you, unlicensed driver, uh, riding a motorbike that's not uh, in your name, crash into another person, they're going to look into that one. And you're going to lose. <laughs> and a bicycle, the opposite happens. Yeah, uh, I'm almost never at fault. And, and uh, yeah, uh, any regulations that they want to slap on me don't apply. I also got to say another advantage of showing up by bike in general. It's badass. It's just badass. It really is. Like, uh, case in point, I went from my, uh, my wife's village and I biked all the way into town, uh, which was like 28K or something like that, and uh, nailed it all out, went to a Quan, drank a beer, washed up, changed shirts, and then showed up uh, to meet folks for the first time. They're like, you bicycled here? From that village? I'm like, yep, there's my bike sitting right outside right now. Hell yeah, hell yeah! That's badass. Damn right, it's next level. So, uh, in a lot of ways, by being able to bike around and by having that gumption, if you will, a lot of folks view it as stronger and better. In other words, if uh, we wanted to look at it from this perspective, if I show up on a tandem and three of my other friends show up on you know, 100 million dong bikes. They're gonna look at me as more badass than them. You're goddamn right. Because I had to actually put my ass there. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. And while we're on the topic, uh, it's really unusual for people to see a tandem bike. So yes, people sneak selfies uh, every day. People point it out every day. When I uh, go to a restaurant, bar, or quan, or something like that, everybody looks at the tin. They've never seen one before. People want to pedal it. Like, can I try? Sure, I'll take you with me. Come on. Yeah. 
So I can actually bring more people, take folks on a first time ride, bring uh, folks out uh, at a coffee shop, bar, or restaurant. Maybe they wanna take selfies and videos and, uh, and wanna hang out on it. Great, you do you, man. Or in my local neighborhood, I can bring the kids around for a ride. Great, we're gonna have a good time. Uncle Bao, Chubao, Chubao, Chubuve. Yeah, so socially speaking, uh, having a bicycle is a step in the right direction. And let's not forget the social aspect of having a bike, especially a tandem, is uh, look, there is an incredible number of biking clubs these days in Southeast Asia. It's really been a trend lately. So that means 10 years ago, there was a couple biking clubs here and there, but now there's hundreds in Vietnam. Every city has a biking club. So you can go out and meet fellow bicyclists and go and make a day out of it. So yeah, that means that uh, anywhere you look in any city, you've got a group of people that you can go and hang with, go kick it with, go bike it with, and make a day out of it, let's say once a month. Along the way, they have like, in Hue City as an example, the Green Sunday program, which basically is a large scale uh, cleanup program going on throughout the city. And you guessed it, it's all done by bicycle. The slogan of take action for green, clean, and bright to Tian Hue has now spread through the whole province. So now we're biking around town. We've got the whole crew behind us here. About 200 bikers, including the provincial leaders, are now biking through various main streets in Hue City, naturally garnering attention about the Green Sunday campaign. in Southeast Asia, it's just more fun. Come on, guys, it's just more fun. When you're going slower, you get to see more details and more things. Uh, you get to read every sign and uh, say hi to people more readily, hop on and off more easily. Uh, you're able to interact with the world in a more real way because you're on a bike. That's awesome, that's awesome. And along the way, like, yes, as an example, uh, my favorite trip to Da Nang was Yes, I went there on a bicycle from Way City. Yeah, it's about 130K one way, by the way, uh, depending on the route. But uh, yeah, that was amazingly fun. It was the, the journey of going there over the course of a whole day was amazing. And, um, you know, swinging back a few days later was beautiful. I saw the country in a way that I never saw it before. So it's just more fun. It's way more fun. And then when my wife and I have a Sunday off and we want to go out to dinner, go to some coffee shops, eat vegan for a day or whatever the case is, um, we go on a tandem. It's beautiful. We get to pedal together in this beautiful harmony. And um, you don't get that on a motorbike in the same way. Likewise, well, on a case of a tandem, a lot of cases there's a whole family, you know, a husband and wife, mom and dad, if you will, and then kid in the back. You're good to go. Uh, that's what my future family is going to look like. So it's more fun, more elegant, more more joyous. And yes, I, it's happened a lot where I picked up friends either at their hotel or at an airport or at a whatever situation. And uh, I say, yep, I'm here in a tandem. That's her only choice. I'll call a grab. No, you won't. Uh, hop on. Every time. They love it. And they just want to cruise around the entire city. Yep. Yep. Uh, a tandem bike in particular is a heck of a lot of fun. Bicycles in general are way more fun. Uh, you get way more freedom, way more places you can go, way more that you can see and do. So to narrow it down to some bottom lines and get some myths out of the way, hey, is it slower? In certain circumstances, sure. Leave 20 minutes earlier. Uh, you'll be fine, don't worry about it. And on average, it's only a difference about 10%. Uh, and in some cases, a bike is faster. Simple as that. Is it more dangerous? Well, what you're imagining is getting sideswiped, you know, by another motorbike. Let's just say. Uh, that is less likely to happen in a bicycle as opposed to a motorbike. And let's face it, in both cases, it's pretty devastating. Uh, but in general, I would say that indeed, for all the aforementioned reasons, Riding a bicycle is safer than a motorbike for questions of speed, liability, hurting other people, 
miscellaneous, you tend to have that chill mentality, it tends to be a better route. The other myth is, hey, I'm gonna get super sweaty and uh, it's, I'm gonna get super tired after this whole ordeal, you know, and whatnot. And again, in certain circumstances, you're absolutely right. Specifically, like in mid-July or mid-August while you're in downtown Saigon, sure, I would imagine that, that you'd probably get pretty sweaty out of the ordeal and so forth and so forth. Probably true, but most of the time it's a non-issue. In fact, once again, show up early, bring an extra shirt, bring an extra whatever you want. And uh, you can pack a bag, show up, relax. If you uh, show up 20 minutes early, sit, relax, have a cold drink, change your clothes, you're off and running, you're doing great. You're feeling more refreshed and better than ever. So in my experience, it's never happened that I have shown up at a place sweaty and exhausted and can't do it, etc. It's never happened. Finally, is it hard and will you get tired? I probably would think so, especially if it's uh, your first day on a bike ever in your life, you know, and you want to go an absurd distance at an absurd rate. I would imagine you probably would get tired, but that's not the case. Uh, when you get a bike, you start to chill a lot more. You start to think, well, hey, I can get there 20 minutes on motorbike. Why don't I take an hour and just chill by bike and not worry about it. And yeah, at that point, it's equivalent to the amount of effort of walking. So I suppose, you know, it could be hard, but generally speaking, take it at your own pace. So that's the big bottom line here. Look, taking a bicycle around everywhere, as opposed to taking a motorbike, it's different. It's very different. It changes your mind. It changes your mentality. It changes your way of thinking about the world. And in my opinion, biased Brad here, for the better, right? Is uh, taking a bike exclusively and no motorbike, is that a good choice for you? I don't know. You do you. You know, you decide for yourself. But as far as I'm concerned, I'm never going back. Once you get a taste for it, once you get used to it, once it becomes part of your life, it's the only way to roll. Best of luck to y'all. Have fun. Enjoy your trip. Enjoy your life. Peace. Hey, what's up, everybody? My name is Brad Hirsch. My Vietnamese name is Bao. I've been traveling the world for close to 20 years here. Yo fui a Lima, Peru, como voluntario y aprendí castellano. Desde ahí, decidí que quería aprender la lengua portuguesa. Sería mi próxima aventura. Uchul se cutanghua, uchul a Taiwan y gaye. Uchul de todo el italiano, todo el mente para. Con pai prate tai fu khat muy tai leo. Tien viet la nguang ru tu bai ko ton. And I feel like I'll be here for the rest of my life. My every morning starts with a 2-2-2 plan. Eh, kia. Ai to bon hen. Ai li cafe. The biggest secret to success. Happy wife, happy life. I'll be in this beautiful city forever. <laughs>